Joining me now is a UFC Walterade fighter who defeated Mike Pyle via first round TKO at UFC 222 this past weekend in Las Vegas. It is Zach Otto back on the program for the first time in a while. Zach, how are you? Uh, doing great. Thanks for having me on again. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Uh, congratulations once again on the big victory over Mike Pyle this past Saturday. How good did it feel to get back into the winning column? Uh, yeah, felt really great to get back there. Um, you know, uh, just having the first couple fights in the UFC, um, I knew I couldn't go uh, losing three out of four. So uh, this was a really important one for me uh, to, get, to get that win again. Otherwise, you know, my job would be at risk. So uh, getting the win, getting the finish, you know, something I was known for coming back or coming up on the regional level and getting back to that uh, felt really great. What what what's your mentality like coming off that loss to Li Jingliang? It was your first knockout loss in the UFC. It was I mean, if we're being you know straight up about uh, about it, it was fairly brutal. Um, your only loss before that in the UFC was a split decision, uh, maybe a controversial one that could have gone your way. Um, what, what's your mentality like coming off that Lee fight? Uh, it was pretty much just like forget and move on. Um, you know, I had a really good training camp for that one. Um, my weight cut was the best to date. Uh, I'd been working on some new things and, and switch some stuff up with my strength and conditioning. And I was really excited to show all that off. And the, the fight just, you know, you make one mistake, you get put down trying to recover, you know, ref steps in and that's it, you know? So um, I tried not to let it bother me or linger too long and just kind of forget and move on. Um, you know, learn to keep my composure a little bit and not force exchanges or, or force the action too much moving forward, but um, I just, I wanted to get back in there as soon as possible and, and, you know, kind of make myself and other people forget about what, it, what happened and, and move on. It must have been a little tough going all the way to Shanghai, China. You're a guy from, from the States, so that's a long flight, and then to fall short after, you know, going through so much, again, the flight, travels, all of that, that must have made it tougher than maybe usual. Uh, yeah, it did. You know, I've been traveling a little bit here now since I got signed to the UFC. It was my third time going international in a, in a row, and uh, for whatever reason, it it was a tough uh, a, a tough camp or a tough time over there, trying to get adjusted to the. Um, you know, you cross over the international dateline, and you're just totally messed up um, trying to get the sleeping schedule and everything back on track. But um, it is what it is. You know, uh, I don't think it would have made a difference. Um, you know, I made a mistake in there and, and at this level, you just can't afford to do that. Um, there was also some other things like leading up to, with that fight, um, uh, we were kind of rushed to the octagon. So like there was no walkout song or introduction. Like we literally had to just beeline it to the cage and quick take our stuff off and start fighting right away. So, um, just everything kind of felt weird about, about the moment, but you know, my opponent was going through it too. So really no excuses. Um, I just didn't show up that night. You know why they did that, like the shortened walkouts? Because usually, I mean, I would assume your your experiences before that was just the typical walkout. You get a couple minutes, and it's fairly, you know, it, it's a good pace. You're not, you know, sprinting to the cage. The the Chinese government had a lot of control over what was happening at the event, and they were going to shut the show off at 10 o'clock, even if Bisbing and Gastelum were in the middle of a round. They would have started turning the lights on and kicking everybody out. So they had a 10 o'clock curfew at the venue and there was a lot of government officials and, and police there to oversee the event. And it was, uh, yeah, it felt like being in Russia and Rocky four, like it was, it was pretty weird experience. Um, yeah, like I said, they were involved quite a bit, but, uh, we were kind of, there was a couple decision fights before me and it was getting pushed back a little bit and they didn't want to ruin the main event. So me and my opponent being the co-main event just basically got rushed out to the cage in silence, um, like immediately and had to start fighting right away. I guess good thing it was a fight pass card. So they didn't have to worry about, you know, so many commercials and being on time as far as FS1 pacing and all that. And also a good thing that Gaslam won early in the first round in the main event or else, who knows, bad things could have yeah, happened. Yeah, if it would have went to a... 
right? If it would have went to a fifth round, I don't know where that would have put us and how that would all work yeah, out. It so. really would have been crazy. I wonder, I mean, you have no say or, or you wouldn't know, but I, I'm just curious. I wonder if this will end up preventing the UFC or, or not preventing, but I wonder if they'll reconsider going back. It's an interesting thought. Yeah, um, you know, they did have a sellout crowd and, uh, you know, it was a big arena and everything. And um, they had quite a bit of successful fights that night for the, you know, the China... Um, fighters um so they were saying that of course they would want to be back but there was quite a bit of obstacles all week um i don't know we'll see B above my pay grade <laughs> yeah i mean anyways let's talk a little uh, more about the mike pile fight could this have gone any better i mean you go in there not only do you get back into winning column you get the first uh, ufc stoppage of your career we'll talk about that or i'll ask you more specifically about that in a sec but i mean were you happy i i assume you, you there's no way you couldn't have been yeah, no, it all went totally according to plan, and I couldn't really be happier. You know, um, there wasn't any damage taken on my part, and um, I felt like I made the proper adjustments. I tried to stay aggressive early in the first round. He he had shown that he kind of had some issues with that in the past with people that, that did that. So um, I tried to stay aggressive early, and then I ended up just kind of picking up on some things that he was doing and was able to capitalize and, and find my opening to, to land the right hand. Um, like I said, you know, no damage was taken on my part. Sometimes even in wins, it, you know, they can be kind of some brutal fights and, you know, you never know what that does to the longevity of your fight career and all that. So it was good to go in there and, uh, get a, a win and a finish when I needed it and come out unscathed and, and get paid, you know? I, I guess the only thing that would have made it better was if I would have got a bonus. Yes, I, I actually uh, had thought about asking that. I mean, I, I noticed that, yeah, I guess the 50 grand went to, uh, who did they go to, Brian Ortega and someone else? Uh, yeah, well, you know, Alex Hernandez had the huge win over Darush, and then, um, but there were some other exciting fights that could have happened, like Mackenzie Dern getting a submission, but that didn't happen. And then uh, with the heavyweight fight, Arflosky and, and Struve, I thought there'd be a knockout there, but... There was a lot of eye pokes, and that went to decision. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking, damn, I'm going to get a bonus. This is going to be awesome. It's going to change my life, you know. And then here comes Brian Ortega with a knockout over Frankie, and uh, you know that was a huge, a huge win for him. And obviously, he got that second that second performance of the night bonus. Well, and of course, I think a big storyline coming out of this fight is that you got the finish, the first finish of your UFC career. Of course, you had two wins before this. They were over uh, Kuchi Kunamoto and, uh, and of course, Josh Berkman. Both of them were split, so very close fights, even if maybe you felt that they shouldn't have been split. Uh, how nice was it, how important was it that you got a very definitive win? Yeah, it felt great, because here I'm coming up on the regional level known for finishes, and then what are the chances of getting three split decisions in a row? Like I, I've rarely heard of that before, you know, maybe one other fighter I've, I've seen that happen, you know, at, at this level. So, um, felt really good. I, even though, like you said, I, you know, if you look at every media outlet with my Berkman and Kunamoto wins, every single media outlet had me winning those fights. So I don't really know where those split decisions were coming from. And, and because of that, it was getting really frustrating. So, um, I felt like uh, this was an opponent for me to be aggressive early on and stay after it. And, and even if it didn't happen in the first round, I knew because of his age, maybe he wouldn't be able to keep up with my pace. So um, it was just kind of the stars were aligned for the opponent and the situation. And I was able to get the finish. This fight was announced uh, less than a month ago, about a month ago now, but definitely a little less than a month before the fight. How, how long did you actually have to prepare and train for this fight? Was it, a bit short notice or did sometimes the UFC just doesn't announce fights until a bit, a bit later on for whatever reason. Have, had you known about it for a while before the official announcement? Uh, no, I had about three and a half weeks for this one. Um, there was about three and a half weeks out from the February 18th card in Austin where there looked like there'd be an opening for Alex Morono. And I said, yes. And then um, Josh Berkman ended up getting that fight. And I found out maybe a week after I said yes that actually I wasn't going to be getting it. But that already kind of got me um, increasing the intensity and frequency of my workouts and getting my diet and everything, you know, right in line with what I do when I, I have a fight coming up. 
And then it was after, it was probably only a couple of days after I found out that the Morono fight wasn't going to happen, that the Mike Pyle fight came in. So it was a little bit more than three weeks I had for Mike Pyle, but that Alex Morono possibility kind of, you know, got me in hard training camp for a little bit before. So were you given an explanation as to why you were offered the Morono fight and then never got it? Um, no, not really. Um, maybe something to do with like the fact that I was then out of contract and they were maybe looking to give it to somebody that was currently under tr- contract and maybe hadn't fought for a little while. I, you know, uh, I had just fought in November. So uh, there's a lot of people signed at 170 pounds. A lot of guys that go eight, nine, ten months without fighting just because there's so many guys signed to that weight class. And here I had just fought three months before that and I wasn't under contract. So maybe they were just trying to kind of spread the fights out a little bit, but then I got the Mike Pyle fight. So I don't really know how they make those decisions. Yeah. No complaints. Um, I've been, I've been fairly active, you know, since I got signed and I'm pretty happy about that. So was the pile fight a little bittersweet at the end of the day, just because he's a veteran it was his retirement fight. And also you, you said, you know, on the record you're you've been a fan of him. He's someone you've looked up to over your career, watching him and things like that. Um, it, was it a little bit bittersweet because obviously you want to go there, go in there and get the job done, but you know, maybe against anyone else you are, are rooting for Mike Pyle. Yeah, for sure. I, I totally get that. Um, like you said, I was a, a big fan of his, so I would like to see him go out on a high note, but with me being the opponent, um, you know, it's just, it's the fight business and I had to fight to keep my job in there. Um, you know, he's had a long, very successful career and he's got the next chapter of his life all lined up and stuff. So this had to be my fight to win, but if he would have been fighting anybody else, I would have been cheering for him and, uh, you know, he's a really cool guy. I got to talk to him a little bit more so than other opponents. Um, you know, we were really friendly anytime we saw each other before and after the fight. And he's just a super cool guy. And, you know, I wish he would have been able to to go out on top here. But it's a, it's a tough sport, you know. How much do you feel like you gained from this fight, from this win? And the reason I ask is because usually a first-round KO win is, is pretty clear as day. You're going to take, you know, walk away with quite a bit, gain quite a bit. But the thing is, a lot of people would say, hey, Mike Pyle, is he, you know, you know, 40-something years old. He's a, quote, shot fighter. But he's still a big name or, or a bigger name. He, this was the fight pass uh, feature prelim. How much ultimately do you feel you gained from this win? I feel like you gain a little bit, you know, from every win. Um but I, I, I really, it really helps my confidence uh, with this win. Even though he's a little bit older, I mean, how many other people have gotten inside the octagon almost 20 times? And, and you know, he's fought all, all over the world, all different weight classes. I mean, he's a true pioneer of the sport. Um, you know, feels a lot better than getting a win over maybe somebody my age that's just kind of a flash in the pan. You know, this guy's been around the sport forever, fighting at a high level forever, and getting a win over him, no matter what his age is, I think is a a big deal. And um, definitely is going to help me out moving forward. This was your first fight in or or fifth fight in the UFC and your first one on a pay-per-view card. Was that nice? Did you, you know, think about it at all? Did that cross your mind? Did you care? Or are you sort of just, it doesn't really matter whether it's a fight night, whether it's on Fox card or a pay-per-view, does it not really, uh, not really affect you all that much? I'd like to keep fighting on the pay-per-views and moving up to where I'm on the pay-per-view section. You know, I'm, I wasn't really thinking about it too much. It was really cool. I, I fought a co-main event on a UFC fight night. I fought on the main card now a couple times. Um, I was, for the first time, like you said, part of a, a numbered pay-per-view event, but I was on the Fight Pass prelim, so it's all kind of a wash. Um, I'm just trying to look at to get get some wins get some finishes and keep moving up and i'll be on the pay-per-view section soon you know and it has to be nice fighting in the in the u.s for the first time since your debut against josh berkman that was of course way back in uh october of 2016 of course the sergio rice fight was in brazil the kunamoto fight was in uh was that australia or new zealand it was new zealand and uh and then your last one, of, of course, was in Shanghai, China. How nice was it being back, you know, in your home country, the U.S., where you don't have to travel, you know, my, you know, hours and hours, you know, not, not a super rough plane ride. 
Yeah, that was probably the biggest thing. When I first got the phone call, that was like my first question even before who the opponent was, was where. Um, you know, fighting out of the country is cool, great experience, and I'll gladly do it. Um, but doing it three times in a row in that far of distances, it was getting pretty rough. Um, like, like I said, the sleep schedule arrangement and um, all that is tough, but then also just trying to find the food and water that you need for the week is tough. Um, you know, you go up to people and you're trying to find out where the nearest supermarket is or something and nobody's speaking English and uh, I don't know. It's just, it, it's, it's much easier and more comfortable fighting anywhere in the States. So I was happy to hear the news that it was going to be in Las Vegas, which was kind of a bucket list place for me fighting at the T-Mobile arena. You know, it's a fight city and um, really cool to get that experience. But then also just Las Vegas, you know, you got all the accommodations, you know, as far as getting the, the water and food that you need and stuff like that for the week. So, yeah, great, great location, great uh, opponent and great results. So couldn't be happier. And I guess at, at the very least, had you fought out of country three times in a row, it would have been better if it was, say, all uh, Brazil or all Auckland, not, hey, three continents back to back where again if you had fought in and say new zealand three times in a row the second and third times are going to be easier you're more familiar you know where stuff is you know where to get water you know where to get food etc etc whereas it, it's different places foreign places all three times back to back to back yeah and and i realize this is a global sport and i think it's super cool that our sport has uh you know it's known globally and we get a chance to travel and do that kind of thing. And I definitely want to do it more, but if it was like every third fight, <laughs> let's do it. But three in a row was getting a little rough. Was this your first time in Vegas? Uh, I had been there just once before in my life. So, um, how long ago? Uh, just in December, okay. actually. What was, so uh, my birthday, my birthday is in December. And, uh, so last June, I think it was, they had the athlete retreat where they brought everybody out to Vegas on the roster and they showed them the performance institute and all that. I unfortunately didn't get a chance to go to that because I was fighting the next week in New Zealand. So I didn't get a chance to go out to Vegas and, and get that tour or anything. So then I fought in November and then I had my birthday coming up right after in December. So my girlfriend and I thought, Hey, it'd be a good opportunity here. We'll go out to Vegas for a couple of days. I'll kind of tour the performance institute and get a chance to, you know, just have some fun in Vegas for the first time. I had never been. So I went out there in December, checked that out, had a, you know, a good time, kind of a little vacation out of it. And then um, I ended up getting the call for this early March fight, uh, which was coming up. How was the PI? Is it as good as a lot of people are saying? I mean, it sounds great. Is it, uh, oh, oh, you know, under uh, underappreciated, over expectations? What, what did you think of it? I think it's a great facility. I mean, they've got nutritionists there and strength and conditioning coaches and a lot of different tests that they can run on the fighters to give you good baseline on maybe some spots that you might be weak in. Um, you know, they've got it all there. They've got um, a kitchen where they put out great food and the meals are free for anybody on the UFC roster and even the coaches and, and teammates that are there with you, you know, can get it for very cheap and stuff. So it's a, a, a really great thing that they, they got going on. Um, I just wish that maybe they had uh, a better living situation possibility there, you know? Um, like, I, I suppose if you want to go there for any length of time, you would either need to stay at a hotel, which could get expensive, or an Airbnb of some sort. Um, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to ask around a little bit more about how those fighters do it that are out there for longer periods of time. After the pile win last weekend, did you stick around in Vegas for a few extra days or were right back home uh, the next day? Uh, we normally try to get back ASAP, but because it was Las Vegas, we kind of had two different flight times that we could have left, and one was really early the next day or one was getting us back kind of late the next day. We decided to go with the late one. So we got a chance to stay out that night kind of late. Um, when I fought in Brazil, we fought at like – midnight or one in the morning so pretty much by the time we got out of there we just went to bed in las vegas i i was done by like 5 p.m so my friends and family you know that's another thing when you're fighting out of the country um hard for friends and family to make it out and stuff i had some a lot of people that made it out 
um, from Milwaukee all the way to Las Vegas. So we were able to have some dinner, you know, have a drink or two and gamble a little bit and have fun that night and then didn't have to wake up for an early flight the next day. So Awesome. Good nice. to hear. Um, this, as you mentioned, was the first fight on your new four-fight deal with the UFC. Just to clarify, when did you sign, re-sign with the UFC? How long ago? As soon as uh, the next fight came in is when I signed the new contract. So I had, I had, I had signed a four fight contract originally that I, I did the length of that contract uh, ending with my last fight on that contract in November. And then um, I wasn't cut or anything like that, but I was just kind of in limbo waiting for that next fight to come in. And then once the Mike Pyle fight came in about three and a half weeks out is when my new contract came were you a little concerned after the uh, Jing Leong Lee fight? Just because we've seen in the past, uh, fairly recently actually, a lot of free agents aren't getting re-signed even off one loss. Where Was that a concern of yours? I mean, look at Stevie Ray. He got knocked up by Paul Felder last July. He just got re-signed very recently. He was in limbo. He would consider maybe retiring, moving on. He, he didn't really know what was going on. Were you concerned about that? Yeah, but a lot of those fighters, like even Rick Story and Stevie Ray and stuff, they had the opportunity to sign before their last fight on their contract and refused because they didn't like the the pay that they were offered. So they thought, okay, let me let me fight this last one, and then I'll go into free agency and kind of test the waters. But then they end up losing that last fight on their contract. So then, you know, they kind of almost, I don't know, weren't happy with what the UFC was offering them and then kind of got into that situation. Um, mine wasn't like that. You know, if they would have offered me another contract after my third fight, I, I would have taken it, but I didn't get that offer. I had to fight my fourth fight, fourth fight on that contract and the fight didn't go so well. So I, I was a little worried, but you got these other guys in my weight class that are like, Oh, and two and getting a third fight, you know, Brian Camozzi and stuff like that. Like how are these guys? Oh, and three in the UFC, getting finished in all three of their fights and they're not, you know, cut as of right now. So I don't really know how they make those decisions. Um, I didn't feel like my job was in jeopardy, but I knew it would have been for sure in jeopardy if I would have lost to Mike Pyle. Right. So, and uh, with this being the first fight on your new contract, it's had to be a great uh, first impression, impression, so to speak, obviously you fought in the UFC before, but first impression for the new contract for the UFC brass, for the matchmakers. Yeah, for sure. I feel like I can get the the ball rolling here and, uh, you know, go after another win, maybe get on that June card in Chicago, which is nice and close to home. And then uh, if I can get, a, you know, another one in 2018, that's kind of my goal, go 3-0 in 2018. Reese, I got another four-fight contract, so I'd like to sign after my third one um, off of three wins and see – see what number that's at so your new new ish contract the one you just signed out before the pile fight it's 18 and 18 so you took home uh 36 uh you know uh, on, on top disclosed and then maybe an under the table bonus might be coming your way who knows um are, are you happy with that you know increase yeah i am um uh, coming off of a, a loss you're expected to just stay the same and coming off of a win you're expected to go up and here I was, I finished out my first contract, ended with a bad loss. I would have been happy with anything they would have given me, even if, you know, just as long as I had a job still at the UFC. So the fact that they bumped me up a little bit uh, going into my second contract was awesome. And, you know, my they restructured the Reebok deal too. So I went up with Reebok um, as well and got the win now. So I'm going up even more and, Things are good. Were you surprised that they didn't let you re-sign or, or renegotiate a deal before the Jing Leong fight? Yeah, I was. Um, again, I, I don't. I can't really say why. I think maybe because uh, my first two UFC fights, I was dealing with Joe Silva, and then Joe retired, and then I was dealing with Sean Shelby, and maybe he had, he just only really uh, was familiar with me with that that last fight, which was uh, Kunamoto in, in New Zealand. And um, that's the only thing I can really uh, think about uh, why I wasn't offered a contract earlier, but I'm not, I'm not really sure. 
Fair enough. Well, Zach, uh, my last question for you. What is next? You you took literally zero damage against my pile last uh, Saturday. When Do you want to get back in there real quick? I know you mentioned you want, uh, I think it was three more wins this year. Um, what what When are you looking to get back in there, and do you have any sort of opponent in mind? I'd like to get back in there sometime this summer. Um, you know, I do like to evolve and, and work on some things and get better in between fights, and then when I find out I have a fight, just kind of polish it up and go in there with, you know, what's my bread and butter. So now is the time to to put new to, new tools in the toolbox, and I do like to take that time to do that. So um, June would probably be the earliest I'd want to get in there, and there is that Chicago card in June. That would be great if that worked out. Otherwise, um, they got to get a card to Milwaukee soon. You know, uh, we've got a lot of fighters out of Milwaukee on the UFC roster, and they like to usually tie in with Harley Davidson, and Harley Davidson has their big 115th anniversary coming up uh, end of August, early September. So hopefully they can they can get something going um, around town, and that would be awesome. As far as opponent, um, I do really want that Alex Morono fight. It came in uh, for February, and I really like the matchup. I think on paper it makes sense. Um, we both have very similar records in the UFC coming off of some first-round finishes over older vets. Um, He fought for Legacy coming up and, you know, won the title there, and I was fighting for Legacy around that time, and I thought that maybe we'd be seeing each other before we even got to the UFC, and then, you know, he got called up and I got called up. So uh, I've known about him for a while, and I I like him as a fighter. I think it'd be a fun, exciting fight and makes the most on paper. So. Awesome, Zach. Appreciate the time as always. Before I let you go, remind my audience where they can find you on social media. And if there's anybody you'd like to thank or give a shout out to, the floor is yours. Yeah, you guys can find me on social media on Facebook or Instagram, just under my name, Zach Otto. And then I'm on Twitter at The Barbarian MMA. And just want to throw a big thank you shout out to Combat Corner. Um, I know a lot of people in the MMA world are very familiar with their gear and, and things. Uh, they're, they're a business right out of Milwaukee. I know the owner very well. And, uh, you know, they're making a, a global empire for a reason. They got the best stuff, and, and they're a great group of guys. So, Combat Corner. 